Um, first of all, I uh, would like to say like thank you for the all the organizer for the conference and uh, for inviting me uh, to be part of it. Um, so uh, for my presentation, I would like to talk about uh, what ha I have learned from uh, um, a single 1960s social housing that uh, so called the white buildings. A part of my ongoing research that uh, titled Genealogy of Bassa. The Genealogy of Bassa mapped the transformations of Bassa area in central uh, Phnom Penh, Cambodia as a community based uh, participatory exercise. And a key objective is to discover, discover a way to visualize the differences in the band form. Uh, over time rather than the historical uh, continuity and characterize the urban rupture through various eras so as the basics for the idea about the future of the city. The mapping exercise takes place uh, within and is informed by the community of Okay, um, uh, for my presentation, is uh, I will talk about uh, what I have learned from a single uh, uh, 1960s social housing that uh, called the White Buildings, a part of my ongoing uh, research titled Genealogy of Baza. Genealogy of Baza mapped the transformations um, of the Baza area in central Phnom Penh, Cambodia, as a community based participatory exercise. A key objective is to discover a way to visualize the differences in a band form rather than uh, over time rather than historical continuity and characterize the urban ruptures through various era to sell basics for the idea of the future of the city. And the mapping exercise uh, take place within and informed by uh, the community of Phnom Penh White Building currently in the street of demolitions and evictions. Um, the Y building is the last fragment of Ambitus uh, Basari Front Cultural Complex. Uh, inside the red line is the Y buildings and the whole area we call uh, Basari Front uh, Complex or Basari Front Projects. Basari Front Project was constructed on the 24 hectare uh, upland field along the swampy uh, plot plan of the Basari River in downtown Phnom Penh. In order to provide more affordable uh, density housing adapt to Cambodian lifestyle and the new cosmopolitan cultural uh, center for Phnom Penh. Uh, before I go like deeply, a little bit deeply to uh, the white building, I would like a little bit to make some uh, a short introduction about what is the modernism in Cambodia between 1955 and 1970. That uh, so-called uh, new Khmer architecture and it, it, for the terminology, the word Khmer is mean uh, refer to kind of uh, the uh, ancient empire of Cambodian. So I can use the word like Khmer or Cambodian. It kind of the same. In nineteen fifty three, Cambodian received fully independent from French. After independent, Prince Rodom Senu abdicated the throne and formed his own political party in nineteen fifty five, which named Songkum Rin Yum. His party uh, won the national election at that year, at that year and uh, Senduk became the first prime minister of Cambodia. Sengkum Rin Yum in his Khmer term with response to socialism in the Western sense, Cambodia enjoyed the unprecedented era of economic social development um, uh, associated with the renaissance of art and architecture. The, uh, Countrywide modernization and construction work was undertaken uh, by national and international experts for urban uh, planning, architectural design, and engineering. Cambodia has several thousand uh, buildings uh, for public and private sector, uh, which has been uh, built be between 1955 to 1970, and influenced by the style that so called new Khmer architecture. New Khmer architecture is uh, described as an architectural movement combining Western uh, modernism with traditional uh, Cambodian uh, architecture. Uh, mostly it was shown in, on public buildings uh, with inspired by Korean architecture and lifestyle of Cambodian people. Or maybe you can uh, call New Khmer architecture as the uh, neo-vernacular uh, neo, uh, architecture. It's also uh, comparable. The team was led by Cambodian well-known architects, uh, Mr. Wan Molwans, 
the picture at the top. One more one who was awarded a scholarship to study uh, architecture at, at the school in Paris from 1947 to 1956. After he came back to Cambodia in 1956, he hold many important positions in, in, in the government of Cambodia, including establishment of the, the Royal University of Fine in Phnom Penh in 1965. So from, uh, from that, I want to, uh, would like to start my presentation on why building uh, from historical point of view. The white building designed by Cambodian um, architect Louis Benhap and Russian engineering uh, Vladimir Bondetsky, inaugurated in 1963. The white building originally comprised of uh, 468 apartments with two types of apartment, one uh, room but apartment and uh, two room, uh, one room, one room, uh, one apartment that have one bedroom and one apartment that have two bedroom and was the first attempt to offer multi-story modern um, urban lifestyle to local and middle class of Cambodian, such as government officer and uh, teacher. The building is about 300 uh, meter uh, length, comprised by six blocks, and each block of the building uh, uh, connected by the open staircase, you can see here. Um, after forced evacuation during the, during the Khmer Rouge regions from 1975 to 1979, some of the former residents, including the white artists, uh, returned to the neighborhood and community grow again as a community of artists. For many Phnom Penh, the white building is pursued an irregular community class stigma uh, associated with poverty, drug, uh, sex worker, criminal, dangerous uh, construction, and poor sanitation. However, the white building is one of the city, the most uh, vibrant community, housing more than 2,500 res residents, including the classical dancer, master, uh, music scene, skills, craft people, cultural worker, uh, civil servant, and uh, street vendor. Architecture as a political ideology. After uh, Seinu became the head of the state, he began to build his visions of a new nation with new Khmer architecture come into consideration and was built throughout the country. Um, new Khmer architecture was often featured in the film and photographed by Prince Rom Senu to celebrate Cambodian modernization during the post independent period from 1953 to 1970. In this slide, you can see the screenshot of one of many films titled Twin Light, uh, with direct by Seinu in 1969. We saw the landscape of uh, the city of Phnom Penh and also new Khmer architecture style. In the description, you can see the suntan we proud of our king, our hero kings. We saw the uh, glory period of the 1960s and the legacy of the Prince Rudolf Senu. This kind of film also uh, screening until uh, today in some important occasion, uh, for example, for the uh, Independent Day of Cambodia uh, through the uh, national television. The foreign state visit was an opportunity to showcase of the kingdom new uh, newborn architecture in, vi in which new architecture was on display. The State leader was often taken along the main boulevard where there, are, there were many uh, iconic modern architecture, including, including the white building. In this screenshot, it's a widow of the visiting of the French uh, President uh, de Gaulle uh, to Cambodia. With, you can see on the left hand, you can see the gray building, and on the uh, right hand, you can see uh, the white building as the background. The white building was designed in the style of new Khmer architecture with proof to be a golden age of optimism and uh, experimentation in with new creative movement of uh, florise. This gave rise to the idea of modern Cambodia of the future who strive to develop their country based on cultural fundamental, in which new building merged European modernization with Cambodian vernacular architecture. Uh, the next point I want to talk about the um, identity and gender. So for, for this point, I just uh, point out 
uh, on only two uh, two points only. One is uh, to the design aspect of the white building and the scan the uh, perception of scale in Khmer culture. The original design of the white building is rest from the ground floor, which is the uh, fundamental of Cambodian uh, wooden Khmer houses. Uh, because of we try, uh, we uh, protect the flooding and also we uh, feed uh, domestic animal on the ground floor and also for protections. And each blocks. This is uh, below is one block, one photo of the block of the white building. So each block of the white building, uh, it kind of similar size of the, the small village in rural area of Cambodia, as you can see the Google map at the top there. And also, um, in the rural area of Cambodia, uh, you can see the Google map up at the top, I mean, uh, between two or three village, rural uh, uh, village of Cambodia, there is one uh, Mang monastery that we use kind of the Mang Monastery uh, 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 um, a place as the gathering and meeting uh, if the villager needs the space. Uh, at the same time, it's comparable to the open staircase between one block of the white building to the other, that um, uh, the open staircase of the white building serve as the community space for now, for meeting, for gathering, or any problem for, you know, talking, circulation, the information is is uh, uh, on the open staircase. Uh, for the layout of each apartment is typically similar to Khmer wooden houses with, uh, there are two separate spaces. Main space is comprised by a living room and bedroom. And a secondary space uh, is a working space, uh, such as toilet and also the uh, uh, kitchens. This space is spread by the a door to avoid smoke and bad smell from the kitchen and toilet uh, to go inside uh, the living uh, space. Um, gender is one of the main issues in Cambodia which is shown in many aspects uh, uh, of culture and society from perception to practice and from literature to architecture. In Khmer wooden houses, the ground floor and the man's space traditionally uh, can refer to man who is the head of the family Man away uh, is the dominant uh, figure, uh, traditionally, uh, who is responsible for feeding family, doing heavy job. In uh, daytime, he work on the open uh, ground floor, feeding uh, domestic animal, doing uh, mechanic work and all other things, uh, with using a uh, kind of manpower. At night, he educate the children in the living uh, room, with also used for sleeping. Thus, both ground floor and also the man. Uh, uh, space can be visually uh, considered as kind of the main area. Whereas the secondary uh, space and the veranda are reviewed as uh, the female area, whose job are like cooking, uh, cleaning, and uh, taking care of children. For the case of the white building, um, the secondary uh, uh, space that you can see at the back here, like kitchen, WC, and a kind of the open space here. And the open staircase here. Uh, that the open staircase is comparable to Khmer Wooden House's uh, veranda, were designed to first elder the spectacular city view or the Four First River. So the Four First River is the intersection of the Four River. Uh, Tun Lesap River, Basak River, uh, Upper and Lower Mekong River at downtown of Phnom Penh. And uh, both the secondary space and the open staircase are the only space that, uh, where people can enjoy the view of the city, water, and interact with their neighbor and the family at the same time. Uh, this is the Four First River. You can see the white building here, first to the for Pacific River and the other side to the whole city. In contrast, the main space of the white building, you can see here a uh, bedroom and living room here. What designed to have limit view, limit ventilation, light, and interaction in the community. 
What this means is that the design is privileged to the experience of women who has access to view and interaction that is not possible for the men to uh, really get to the indoor space. In order to better understand more about a uh, uh, kind of uh, related to the gender uh, on the topic on, of the white building, it is useful to compare the white building to its uh, neighboring building, the gray building. Uh, this is the gray building, this is the white building. The gray building uh, uh, designed by uh, Van Molywan, it was complete in 1963 for Southeast Asian game as uh, apartment for international athletes. The gray building is uh, one time and a half bigger than the white building. We, we can refer to the traditional perception of the scale in Khmer culture that small body is for women and lighter body is for men. We can also see deeper system in ancient Khmer temple in Simri. If you, uh, uh, you know, uh, went to uh, Cambodia, you surely that you want to visit Simri because a lot of like temple, especially Angkor Wat. Uh, there are two pictures. At the top is Angkor Wat temple and below is Manti Strait temple. Angkor Wat was built as the tomb for the king. It's the, the, the male figure, and Bhante Srey was able to represent the female figure that is much more smaller than uh, the size of Angkor Wat. Um, the next point I will uh, talk about informality. The utopian dream of, dream of the 1960s was derived by civil war. By the late uh, 60s, Cambodia was uh, financial wrecks and domestic pol uh, politics were turning against Sehendu. American intervention in the war in Vietnam spilled over. Between 1970 and 1973, American bombed the countryside of Cambodia, which caused the extensive immigration of rural Cambodia to uh, Phnom Penh. In 1975, the Khmer Rouge entered Phnom Penh and began to rewrite the urban landscape of the city by emptying its population, including the white building. Uh, ruin, ruining its physical furniture and destroying its social fabric. Um, this saw the whole area of Basa Riu Front project, oh, Basa Riu Front uh, area uh, after the war. You can see the white building is here. And the whole area is, is kind of a uh, squat uh, squatter. After the collapse of the Khmer Rouge in 1979, people returned to Phnom Penh from different parts of the country. Phnom Penh suffered from the lack of planning and the government's goal to uh, provide for more shelter for many people who demand to live in the city. Many squatters built their home on uh, public land and lakes, <coughs> including in and around the white building. The land on both sides of the white building were occupied by squatters. Those people include uh, taxi driver, police, military, officer, carpenter, artist, and so on. Um, so. The Ikrahom community, which was one of the biggest slum area in Phnom Penh uh, with 1,465 households spread over 4.7 hectare, located directly be behind the white building, was evicted in 2009 by the authority. The area was sold to a private company and is now home to swanky restaurant, bar, and also entertainment joint. After the war, in order to provide shelter uh, for artists and to revive the human resource for the art, the white building became uh, artist resident and, uh, under Ministry of Cultural Information at the time. Two blocks of the building on the north side was filled with dancer, music scene, artists, and filmmaker. While the other four blocks of the building uh, remained em empty until the late 1980. The informal structure at by resident uh, has become some of the most significant elements of the white buildings. They are not only so how the building has evolved through the different uh, period of era, but also how resident respond to shifting political and social uh, contact by adapting their urban way of life. Um, smart building and smart city. Um, 
like like other part of uh, uh, Phnom Penh's uh, city, to meet living demand, residents close up the open ground floor of the building by building partition to create more housing unit and micro uh, business store. Residents also add bed patio area to most apartments in order to create more spaces for sleeping, cooking, and storage. Other uh, other extra built-out spaces has been added to the buildings such as uh, steel roof, masonry room partitions. The way which the white building was designed is flexible, so there was uh, many open spaces which can be added on both ho horizontally and vertically to extend the physical structure and accommodate more people. By way of unrecturated, the white building uh, community made their own um, architecture that worked for them. And this idea kind of, I just point out a little bit uh, parallel with the idea of architecture without architects. Uh, related to the typology of built out spaces, there are two uh, uh, kinds, a single balcony that divide into a kind of uh, three type, and the ball balcony that uh, we can divide into a uh, five type. The building also involved into a town with eight commercial uh, center over into its space. Many restaurants, uh, coffee shop, gro grocery shop, and uh, card game and gambling then open inside the corridor and add the ground floor of the building. Those have become not only the space for having soft drink, buying food or playing, but also the place for gathering and circulating social information. From personal matter to political movements, they are the places for alternative use. Um, one example of many, every Sunday a film is screening for the children living inside the white buildings. So the film screening takes place at one of the coffee shops on the ground floor at 5 p.m. It means after the coffee shop uh, uh, closed. The variety of color of the roof and at patio and the blue vertical pie, the green herb, um, the built out space and the gray color of the extension wall has created a negative image of the white building in the eye of many upper and middle class people in the city. However, to other, it is precisely this color that represents the urban grassroots that has made the white building one of the most uh, livable buildings as well as the alternative future of uh, the city. Um, after, after this, I will talk a little bit about the, the art, because as the white building as uh, the building of art community. After the Civil War, the state provided classes to Cambodian uh, yard, allowing them to acquire basic uh, artistic skill. The class has been taught by all master artists who live in, in the white building. These master artists not only transfer, transfer their knowledge to the new generation of art community uh, in Cambodia, but also engage many people to come to the white building through their performance and work. They are an important resource for the new generation of artists and activity, and they provide a strong voice for the community and Cambodian society as a whole. They are Several art organizations such as the Art Project, uh, as is a school and on photography Cambodia, uh, has moved into the building to organize public and art events to connect artists and community inside the building to the wider civil society. Such event has helped to introduce the wide building community to the public and to raise awareness of the building and its residents through interactive art experience. Both the the white building resident and outside people has been invited to part participate in the art event in the buildings. The white building community has had opportunity to talk, share, learn, engage in a dialogue with their uh, in, a, in in a dialogue with those people about their challenge and the hope uh, with the outsider. At at act. As a facilitator to connect and foster communication between people. Through this dialogue and communication, the future of the city more widely can be evaluated. In addiction, uh, urban transformation can be pursued and operationalized through art and cultural projects. Art 
artistic experimentation can be a means of expanding the role of urban design practice and urban theory through interaction, collaboration, and dialogue. The white building is a place where art can be displayed, practiced, and learned, and from where the future of alternative urban uh, life can be reimagined. In my research, I um, also produced a 25-minute uh, video to measure the relationship between the people and species inside the white building to expand the capacity of measuring and visualizing those relationships. Uh, cinematics is put into consideration. Brian McGrath and Jane Garner's book, uh, Cinematic Architectural Drawing Today, know the importance of cinematic in architecture and urban designs. A practice of 21st uh, century, they insist, cinematic is best within an expanse field of architecture today that includes film, contemporary uh, cultural criticism, philosophy, science, and art. Here I use film to map the current condition of the white building in order to visualize the movement and the relationship of bodies and objects in the special time. And now, and, and how they work in the, the current uh, uh, urban fabric. The film was shot in close up, medium, and long distance uh, to measure and visualize the relationship between special movements, body, and environment surrounding. Because of my timings, uh, uh, the film that I'm gonna do so use is only uh, three, uh, three minutes and a half because of kind of did and uh, cut uh, from 25 minutes of, of uh, films. Oh, okay, let's come.
Thank you very much. Donc, euh, bonjour à tous. Euh, on va commencer par euh, rentrer en Europe dans cette journée euh, très euh, géographiquement euh, disparate, enfin, ces deux journées. Et euh, pour vous donner une idée, on va tout de suite... Comment... Enfin, alors, je précise une chose. Je parle un peu, on parle un peu sous contrôle de nos compatriotes italiens qui sont dans la salle et qui sont beaucoup euh, sur... Euh, Enfin, peut-être un des bâtiments les plus connus de l'histoire de l'urbanisme moderne euh, en Italie euh, et sur lequel on est, euh, on vous le racontera, mais euh, on est au début, enfin, ça c'est la première, toute première restitution euh, d'une recherche euh, qu'on espère pouvoir se prolonger. Et puis, euh, donc, euh, pour commencer, vous pouvez peut-être euh, multiplier par trois le « white building » et le faire monter de trois étages. Donc c'est trois fois la longueur et trois fois l'auteur euh, de l'immeuble que vous avez vu. Et ben, voici euh, Corviale. Donc, vas-y. <rire> euh, le grand serpent, l'immeuble kilomètre, la prison. Le grand mauvais palais, c'est Palazzaccio. J'ai pas trouvé, on n'a pas trouvé de meilleure traduction l'immeuble cité. Les noms donc se multiplient dans une surenchère de métaphores qui retentissent tel un hymne à l'erreur. Ainsi se présente Corviale, euh, qui est très difficile à photographier en entier et très difficile à explorer en entier, avant même que l'on l'approche. Encore euh, un de ces topoi de trop plein qui nous habite sans y avoir jamais mis les pieds. Corviale, ou plus exactement Nuovo Corviale, Nouveau Corviale, est une sorte d'évidence dans la démesure est à explorer. 75 000 m cubes de béton, 958 mètres de long, 200 mètres de large et 30 de hauteur sur une zone constructible d'environ 60 hectares dans ce qui est euh, l'une des plus grandes barres rectangulaires du monde, s'organise euh, sur neuf étages, 1202 appartements pensés pour faire vivre ensemble euh, environ 8500 voisins. Alors c'est vrai que si on compare avec tous les bars et tous les, les systèmes de grands ensembles qu'on a vus euh, ces deux jours, euh, enfin, ça ne fait pas grand-chose finalement en termes de nombre d'habitants et de nombre de logements. Je pense à la Pologne tout à l'heure. Voilà. Mais bon, là, on est euh, en Italie et on est effectivement sur un seul bâtiment, ou ce qui est considéré un seul bâtiment, euh, sachant que euh, la notoriété de, cette, de, cette, de ce cas est due à justement cette euh, longueur en continuité, mais finalement, euh, le système est bien plus large. Donc, il ne s'agit pas d'un seul bâtiment, mais d'un système. Encore une précisation, notre rencontre avec Corviale a été euh, le fruit d'un hasard, ou mieux faudrait-il was the outcome of a coincidence around lots of towers, the Harlem projects in the Bronx, the micro rayons in Ulaanbaatar, the meanders of the HLM buildings in uh, Dakar, the facades, uh, the yellow facades and the um, the encumbered spaces in Vietnam and Rangoon. Here we are at the foot of this one kilometer long in the significant banality of the rural periphery of our native country. The invitation to visit the field did not come from our personal curiosity or from a research program in which uh, Corviale was a case study we chose. In fact, it, it is a terrain that has been covered by many urbanists and architects in researching. So we would not have really chosen it as a case study, even though the people we work to said you know, say that we always end up looking at places that have been the object of a great deal of study. So it's confirmation. It's true. That's what's happened. We're on a well-known terrain. 
It's a place that's been explored and studied. So it's become a, a form of laboratory, uh, particularly for young architects and urban planners. This time, the invitation came from the practical side, an international competition uh, promoted by the ATER, the Territorial Agency for Social Housing for the Municipality of Rome, and funded by the Lazio region. So, Regionale Corviale, a call for projects to redesign what they called a monster, to give it new life, to rehabilitate it in both the literal and the real sense of the term. Um, and to definitively put off the concept of its demolition. So this looked like an opportunity we didn't want to miss. Uh, we were uh, in a team of which uh, certain people here were uh, members. So this seemed like an opportunity we didn't want to miss, because to measure ourselves against Corriviali, against its spaces, against its inhabitants, its metaphor, our own ambition, was really to come and see, look closely, to see what it was like now and to uh, to try and land there like a sort of space ship. So we're going to try to put across to you the strange banality and the exceptionality of this space and to see uh, how Corriviali can add a, a brick to this um, colloquium on, uh, on the larger states around the world. So where are we? Where is the location? South of Rome, the new Corviale, Nuovo Corviale, is in a pre-existing zone, which is at the boundary of the Roman countryside, not far from Via Portuense, and previously occupied by orchards and pastures at Valle Portuense, near the port of Fomicino, and not far from the Gra, which is um, the Roman equivalent of the peripheric in Paris. Corvielli belonged to the Vatican. The, this land was acquired by the Matteo family in 1925, the noble family. Then it remained in the family, and then in 1802, Pope Pius VII uh, started the campaign for the agricultural con colonization of the era. The Matteo family responded by sending a team of farmers, but uh, it failed because of an epidemic of malaria. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, this was uh, divided up, and this became an official district. It was first informal. It was only in the beginning of the 1960s that it became an official district after with uh, an emergency housing program, the area, the Green Hill area, was chosen for the Corviale project. So what was it about, this project? Nuovo Corviale. Uh, up to you now, up to you. Oh, I can't remember. Uh, still, no, Novo Carriale was designed in 72 by a team of architects headed by Mario Fiorentino with the desire to move away from the principles of urban development in Rome and in its periphery by proposing a different model of dormitory towns that would be established on the periphery of the city and also the illegal buildings, the Borgate, they were official Borgate, there were self builds and official borgate, uh, built in the fascist period, which characterized that landscape. The inspiration was clearly uh, that of the uh, Corbusier's um, megastructures. So this project was part of the quest for a new dimension of housing, a radical alternative to. Uh, urban sprawl in the suburbs and of the uh, separation between residences and services as well as the social de deterioration characterized by the uh, suburban fabric. So here we can see the discourse which is driven by a sort of ideology of the suburbs, a sort of competition between suburbs and center. 
which, which this project was supposed to provide a balance in. Nuovo Cardiale was built with the first, as part of the first, the Rome, city of Rome's first uh, plan for economic construction. The autonomous institution for um, social housing. The state only got involved in the second half of the 1980s to co fund specific programs, which we'll talk about later. Over a building area of uh, 60 hectares, Ferreri imagined a system of several buildings, often called horns. I decided to explain this project. You'll see it's not, it wasn't simple to reconstitute, to reconstruct what was in Ferentini's head at the beginning and to describe it. So we'll give you some sort of um, landmarks to help you understand what changes were made by the inhabitants and what meaning we, what interpretation we've tried to give to them. So Fiorentini imagined a system of several buildings, often called horns, on the original plan. Uh, I can't think of the horns or, horns or bodies. 960 meters long, 27 meters high, made up of six elements of different size, interconnected by nodes which correspond to entry systems and a vertical service. Body two, body two, which is right at the front of the building, you can see, parallel and interconnected by five points to body one, is also, also consists of six lower buildings, um, high, about 11 meters high. Here again, you have smaller apartments, uh, probably for rent, that was the predominant system. And they are intersected by public services, in co which correspond to the entry points to the blocks and the vertical passageways. There was supposed to be a crèche, uh, a nursery school and local services, plus an activity center for cultural center, an amphitheater, open air amphitheater. So what we're architects would call a very generous project. Body three at an angle of 45 degrees. In fact, the orientation is completely the opposite, but the photo was taken uh, at the time from the model, so we can't turn it around. The north is at the bottom. It consists of a variable height interrupted at three points by the road passing through it. Within this building, there was a plan for a pedestrian street with shops. In the center of the system is Corriviale Centro, made of uh, a set of buildings, which is supposed to be a socio-cultural center of the uh, complex, with administrative offices, um, the uh, the heat center, the heat, the power generator. Obviously, the, the most imposing structure, and most specific, is that of body one, which will would become is the iconic space of the whole, consisting of ten floors above ground, and eight of which dedicated to housing. One floor called piano libero. In other words, a free, free story situated, depending on the sections, on the third, fourth, and fifth level. And imagined as a place for the development of an internal street through the opening, intended opening of shops, uh, craft centers, workshops, and all sorts of um, public interest locations and premises, and a big garage providing parking space for each apartment. The topology of the apartments ranges from T4s, 65 square meters, T5s, and T6 and T7. So between 65 square meters as the smallest and 115 for the biggest apartments. Uh, quoting Ferentini again, it should be seen as a piece of linear city, not just as a house. So it seemed important to see the entry points as real squares, public squares. It's interesting to see that this 
This choice of um, figurative space or formal space coincides with the organization of management into five living places. So these squares are five entry squares into the city. And then in, for body one, the complex, the housing complex is divided into five units with their own entry squares uh, for triage and control, a uh, sort of uh, caretaker, and uh, as a place of meeting for the residents of the building, and in particular for uh, school-related activities, extracurricular. So these are kind of social spaces attached to each block, which are both a sort of entry square but also uh, sociable spaces at the level of each floor for a collective life which would develop within the building and to generate this kind of city, this linear city. Uh, in this um, spirit of, restore, of creating urban life, uh, he also devised the signage and uh, toponymic system for Corviale. He thought it was necessary or advisable to develop an artificial system in the process of planned design. It should uh, include a certain number of references uh, to the historic city. Once inside the linear city, it's clear that the approach to the system of movement for pedestrians cannot be ordinary and linear. Uh, banality is just the availability of space, so we've set up a visual system which operates at different levels through signage which moves from the architectural scale to the individual apartment scale. All these programmatic elements and their translation into spatial form create a sort of language, a mixed language between a formal language and um, and the condominium language. So Finiento seemed to want to broaden the system of condominium management to an entire city that he was trying to plan. His spatial project includes both um, an ideology in its social approach, which would actually fail before the building um, was finished and all the apartments were assigned to people. It was social housing. And once it was built, in fact, the project was found caught between uh, two ideological systems. Uh, it em emerged from the war with a strong ideological, uh, ideological uh, climate. And then it followed, was followed by a period of uh, political control. So Corviali, as the biggest parallelipede ever built, and we saw with the other presentations of Italian cases and social housing, they were looking for a new model of urban development, an alternative to the historic centers and the spontaneously direct periphery. So this model became operational in Italy through the approval of the plan for public housing. And as we saw at, um, in Scapia in Naples, and we've seen in Genoa, uh, it's similar to other big systems. So what was the situation at the time of this building? In fact, it was a landscape that connected the uh, public city and the spontaneous city. And let's uh, show a photo that gives you an idea of this transition. In fact, we have a whole series of uh, portraits made by Pasolini, who portrays the quantity of the, the degree of self-build that was typical of the city of Rome and of Italian cities at the time. So it was, they were self-built borghi, uh, uh, sort of cottages, huts, which formed a very large percentage of the city of Rome, um, which also which in parallel gave, um, in order to confront, deal, tackle this problem of inhabitable house, uh, informal housing and the need for housing also triggered all the big operations of social housing but which ultimately gave rise to what we can call occupations, particularly in the 1970s, big, big uh, movements of political demand 
portrayed in a lot of photographs like that by Tonomani, who is the who took this photo. And finally, what's typical of Italy, as we've seen in the three examples, there is an extremely strong mix between the production of what is called the public city, in other words, social housing, and also then this tendency to self-construction and occupation and political demand in housing. Uh, these two phenomena in Italy are constantly interwoven. And finally, it should perhaps uh, not be forgotten that we're in a system where the state uh, actually follows this movement. It, anticip it doesn't anticipate, it follows it which means that the degree of abusive um, construction in Italy is immediately caught up by, not immediately, is, is from time to time caught up by the state with what's called a condon, a kind of uh, legalization, regularization of self-built and of illegal construction. The same is true of the occupation of buildings. It's very common for people to squat in buildings and the state follows with waves of what we call legalization, uh, legalization of part of the illegal and illicit occupation of space, which brings us to want to um, look at the history of the construction of this building in parallel with the history of its um, of the way it became occupied in order to explain how how this building was self-produced by its inhabitants. So now we arrive at the construction of Corviale in 1975, uh, which is when the construction began, and there were four different contractors who were awarded the contract, because we'll see that created problems. In 1982, uh, some of the contractors went into bankruptcy, which interrupted the construction, but because of the housing crisis that Marina was talking about it, and the political pressure on the three buildings, so the state started to allocate the, uh, the apartments before the building was actually finished. And the administrative procedures associated with the state of the building, 500 buildings, the families occupied the unfinished building. And that was what we call them, in, that was 1978. So in 83, 700 families were expelled, evicted, who were already uh, registered on the list. Uh, so they had a right to uh, an apartment in La Corvielle, but they were expelled because of the impossibility of finding an alternative solution. And while they claim their right to a home, so they proceeded to camp opposite the uh, block, which was still under construction. They stayed there for about a year and they gradually built themselves spontaneous homes little by little. At the same time as construction work was underway on Corvialli. So in 1984, the building site was said to be completed, but it was not until 1988, because of the procedures of allocation of happens, it was not until 1988 for the process of allocation should be complete, to be completed. But that doesn't mean that the projects were finished. In fact, uh, the plan included services and amenities which were not necessarily built, and some of them hadn't been built at all, and others were built but left empty, but we'll see that later. So in order to tackle this, this, the residence associations were set up in order to um, tackle this lack of services and also to use the spaces that were not yet employed. So, so then we get to 1990, and we see a series of buildings open up, open up by the residents, in other words, who organize them themselves through residence associations. 
So there was a clinic, a self-managed one, a boxing hall and a, a trattoria, a restaurant set up and also um, so it remained within the uh, perimeter of the project and behind uh, they installed um, kitchen gardens which were also managed by the residents. Uh, a sort of valley uh, So these were kind of spontaneously developed um, kitchen gardens. And then we arrive in, we get to 1995 next, which is quite an intense year. 200 foreign families were occupied the building and then were evicted in the course of the year. Then they uh, created a, um, uh, a, sen uh, a sense of the third age uh, for all the people managed by the residents. And then they thought perhaps it was time to finish the project, so they started to, to finish one of, of the parts of the central part of the project, which was the uh, multi purpose center. So work began on that. At the same time, something very important, the inhabitants began to occupy the free story, the free floor, the empty floor. This is a standard, standard cross-section. And why, why did they occupy that space? As, as Marianita has already said, the architect had planned on the basis of Corbusier's inspiration, uh, a sort of, in some cases on the fourth floor, sometimes the fifth floor, it's quite complicated, it varies from one to another. I don't want to go into detail. He had planned uh, an empty floor dedicated to shops because of a problem of management and of putting these shops in, the floor remained empty until uh, until uh, 95. And then the inhabitants, uh, the, 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 the families and staff that have children, they decided to occupy that empty floor in order to create space for their children. So now, now let's come to the current situation. Uh, we went there in 2015. The current situation, occupations, illegal occupations continue in the central part. They've occupied what, what they call a pH, which is a, a sort of cultural center. There's a cultural center in the service center. Uh, the, the, the point of the uh, arrow, which is not the part, which is a sort of uh, supermarket. At the same time, there is a sports center which cuts through a building. So to sum up, there are projects, official projects that are still going on. And at the same time, activations, occupations conducted by the residents. And then what we have, a debate on the possibility of de demolishing the whole thing. And then three projects which have never been completed. For, first, in 2005, two projects to refurbish the building, one for the fourth floor, which had been transformed from uh, an empty floor into uh, a residential space with 25 families who completely redefined the space to make it a living space. And then the famous uh, Regionale Corriari, the project that we talked about earlier. So now what you have is a whole series of images which retrace the type of transformations that have been conducted by the inhabitants. That's the fourth floor that was supposed to be empty and has now been filled in by the inhabitants themselves. Here you can see a standard cross-section of the facade, which Florentina had planned, which has also been occupied. Then you have here one of the Sacadimilian uh, in the center, 
This occupation is kind, as Caroline said this morning, occupation by family affiliation. As the family grows, people don't want to leave, so the spaces are filled in with new family members so that the family can maintain its social relations. And what you have here, all the other types of redefinition of space, redefinition of spaces, which are very important because you can see that people have tackled the gigantic scale in order to establish spaces they can actually manage. For example, the management it takes place in sections, as Fiorentino had proposed, but was never actually activated. And also a reappropriation, which um, the domestication of these great corridors, which run on for co kilometers, which have been cut up into sections. So I'll go quickly through. So I want to come, yeah, you need to be very quick. Uh, this is the same. And this is a new thresholds, new demarcations in space managed by the inhabitants. And finally you have, and then you also have a whole question dealing with this multiplication of spaces, social spaces that Fiorentino had proposed, um, which were never in fact activated according to their original program, but have finally been activated 10 or 15 years later by the inhabitants themselves. There's a whole series of services that have been produced by the inhabitants themselves, which were designed for certain services, but it remained completely empty, the boxing center, etc., tango center, and the pH. So to conclude, what seemed important was to consider the question of this in-between space, what Corriviale tells us about in-between spaces. In the end, we can see, uh, perhaps we haven't explained it, but we can see very clearly that what's interesting in the approach taken by residents, they don't all agree, there are plenty of internal conflicts, there are reciprocal accusations of all kinds. The illegitimate inhabitants of the fourth floor who are accused by the inhabitant, legitimate inhabitants of the rest of the building. What's interesting in any case is that we have in-between spaces, but those in-between spaces are not just defined by the available space, but also defined by the failure of the project to finish, the fact that the project was never finished. Uh, it's led to reoccupations and reappropriation by the residents of, of spatial in-between spaces. But there are also temporal in-between in spaces, uh, the shift from one ideology to another. And this ideology of the possible community uh, never came into being between the 1970s and 90s. We, we find a complete change in the perception of family life and community life. People can have the resources to have a restricted family life. And so, and so for example, the collective laundries were never used. They were simply destroyed on the roof of the building. And then there's an institutional in-between space and management in-between space, which is very specific of Italy, which sort of creates this abandonment or by the state, but also the adjustment between illegal, illegitimate occupations or claims for occupations and then the system of allocation that is so slow that the inhabitants decide to occupy the building themselves and manage it themselves in their own manner. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to start with a question, simply to see a bit who's ever been to Bulgaria here. Um, less than two and ten people, but it's not bad. Usually there's just one person who raises their hand in the room, so it's reassuring to see their time. So my, my uh, presentation is based on, it's called uh, Microarray, and what is it? I'll begin by presenting then a description of what a microarrayon is to situate the context, and then we'll go directly to the Ville de Varna, which I started as part of my thesis, and talk a little bit about, about territorial planning. And now, in the case of a small district which is called Trochevo, and what planning has enabled the construction of and what the inhabitants do now. Very quickly, 
uh, architect diplômé d'État et enseignant des territoires dans le cadre de l'enseignement. A state architect. So as part of my teaching, um, I now direct a master's project on Bulgaria. And that's in uh, the Architecture School of Toulouse. In order to situate things, Bulgaria today is one of the old Soviet bloc countries. It is not officially part of uh, the former Soviet Union, but it's part of the allied popular democracies. Today, Bulgaria is broken down into archipelago towns headed by Sofia as its capital, then by the city of Blovdiv, and then the city of Varna. So we have a network of cities which all claim to be capital of some things. Sofia is the administrative capital, Plovdiv, capital of culture, and Varna is the capital of youth. So we have a competition between uh, cities, which is very marked for the title of capital. Bulgaria, uh, its maximum was 9 million population. In the mid-1980s, a little before the collapse of the Soviet Union, we see that uh, it underwent a long period of demographic loss, losing almost a quarter of its population. So we moved from a, a country of 9 million, maybe the size of uh, Aquitaine, Croissant, a city which would be about 5.2 million people. So there's a big demographic loss which is very very marked the worst in Europe the greatest in Europe and perhaps in the top five in the entire world but Bulgaria is also has a very rich past since we start with the first Ottoman cities which were built under the Roman cities and the first modern cities after the independence of Bulgaria in 1868. Then in 1944, the principles of the communist city, all the research carried out by communists and uh, Soviet architects. How do you develop micro rayons, micro districts? How do you develop this micro city for the new communist state? And now we have the post communist city, more generally in uh, uh, social science uh, community. And since uh, 91, we have a long process of deindustrialization, of spatial privatization, of uh, touristification of the city centers, because one of the best ways to um, earn money is through tourism. But we also have processes of gentrification in the old suburbs. Um, and then uh, a kind of ghettoization and a phenomenon of urban sprawl, suburbanization, which is a social uh, process, uh, which is the rich are moving into the suburbs, whereas the, the rest of the inhabitants uh, don't have the same uh, degree of. Uh, of social mobility, they remain in the city. The problem, as I defined it in my thesis, was how do we define programs of participatory development in Bulgaria? I formulated the idea that this legacy from the communist time could become a heritage if it was looked at slightly differently. And in order to look at it differently, I tried to see how the inhabitants today uh, appropriate and uh, transform these places. So what is a micro-district? The micro-rayon or micro-district, um, uh, as I defined it, has uh, precursors in Russia but also in the US and in Europe, Western Europe. So I went back to the 1930s at the beginnings of the Russian avant-garde who were liquidated by Stalin. The uh, Giro Rayon were developed in the 1920s and 1930s in Russia. They were never applied because the constructivists disappeared in the 1930s, but this idea of building big estates already appeared in Russia in the 1930s. On purely practical questions, the prefabrication of housing arrived in the Soviet Union with uh, the processes of Albert Camus, but also uh, Rula Camus, I thought so, and of Albert Camus. I always confuse the engineer and the philosopher. Albert Kahn, who was the architect, who imported into the Soviet Union many processes of manufacture. Today, these prefabricated uh, houses are both the uh, legatees of uh, the US, the cons Russian constructivists, and French engineers. After, after 954, after the death of Stalin, Khrushchev 
I made a speech which uh, spread into the whole, had consequences for the whole of Eastern Europe. Stalinism, Stalinist architecture has seen its day, and we now need to look at uh, better construction under real uh, socialism, and we're going to move on to prefabricated construction. So in uh, Western Europe at the time, they were developing forms of uh, prefabrication, and since there were still contacts with the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union and the West, it was an opportunity for commercial technological partnerships to develop a large-scale architecture for post-war architecture in Soviet Union. So in his speech, uh, Khrushchev said that to work faster and go further, the idea was to work on a very small number of typologies to advance as quickly as possible. So we now see some massively, massively planned um, housing projects, national planning, and the development in different regions and different cities and then districts, new spaces of communism. So we get some standard projects of socialist architecture with mass prefabrication and economies of scale through the use of um, but we can see that now, despite the, um, the showcase uh, of communism building uh, the um, spaces of tomorrow, we can see that most of these spaces were never completed, and they miss mo they're missing most of their amenities and services. It's essentially a problem of financial resources because we can say that the economy was uh, excessively focused on housing production and the services and amenities were financed by the state and to be honest there wasn't much state control over that so now we arrive at some aborted modern constructions if I talk about the uh, micro rayon here nobody knows what we're talking about but if we talk about the the uh, monastery of villa in Bulgaria that might tell, you, know, you might know about that, but you'll never have heard of these micro rayons. These projects have been completely forgotten, even though they're built and inhabited. There's very little uh, heritage policy or, or residential policy. They're completely forgotten and ignored and left to their residents. So let's go on to the planning of Varna. Varna is the most east, east, easternmost town in Bulgaria by the sea. It's gone through several stages. It was once a Greek colony, then it was Thracian, then Ottoman, then little by little it became the city that was going to become the spearhead of uh, architecture in Bulgaria. So very quickly, this was going to become a seaside city. So to go very quickly, the period that uh, I'm going to talk about is the period from 1964 to 1969, at the time when uh, they were starting to do some large-scale prefabrication, moving away from brick and small-scale concrete to prefabricated panel construction, minimum of nine floors, and after to um, 16 floor buildings. And we're talking particularly of Trochevo, which was built in 68 and finished in 75. So Varna, like many uh, cities in Eastern Europe at the end of the war, was renamed Stalin, Varna Stalin. You often see that in Eastern European countries. Lots of cities were named Stalin after the supreme leader. Uh, in 1953-1956 was a key period, the death of Stalin, Khrushchev's report, the need for a new plan, the move away from the old planning approach, and a move to what's going to become mass architecture. So Kirill Makarov, the architect, was asked to develop two plans. One plan just before the death of Stalin, just one just after, because uh, the party line had changed. So Arimov's uh, plans, plan for an extension of the city to the north, particularly along the ridge, ridge line, in order to construct cities, uh, districts that would be independent of each other and completely autonomous with their own services. In the communist architecture, the idea was not to depend on the city center, but to have entirely functional, autonomous districts, even under their own management. In uh, 1964, the Bulgarian state 
published a plan, perhaps the biggest plan of, for Bulgaria in the mid-20th century, which was the planning of the Black Sea. Ten years after the Khrushchev report, Bulgaria was ready with its factories to produce uh, prefabricated plans. It took 10 years uh, to build the factories and the first production of prefabricated panels. So the announcement was that uh, we're going to produce panels, but in fact it took 10 years before everything was put in place. The 1964 plan required the exceptional architecture, exceptional architecture to be built along the Black Sea in order to have a, a facade uh, effect to show to what extent socialist architecture was avant-garde, whereas heavy prefabrication, standardized prefabrication, we should be behind the facade. It's a system where they want to showcase. Everything exceptional had to be visible to the public. Everything um, micro rayon, zero rayon should be done behind as discreetly as possible. So after Varna, there were two periods until 1985. There were the first Euro rayons along the ridge line, and the second wave, which corresponds more to with Bulgarian post came in 1985, which was the return of prefabrication to the city centre. In the 1980s, the Arimov plan was no longer sufficient to. Um, match the, the degree of building. A new plan was then established for Varna. Unfortunately, the plan itself was always uh, behind the reality and had not anticipated the extension of the city over the next few years. And it was impossible to catch up with the urbanization that had taken place. In 91, after the fall of the Bulgarian Communist Party, the proposed plan was simply a report on the existing so there was still 10 years behind the reality. Today, the city of Varna, if you look at the tourist maps, this is what you see, a little, little bit of, of what is the city of Varna, and essentially the historic center. All the activity and all the projects focus on the coastline and particularly on the historic center. As the economy is down, tourism uh, is what brings in the most money most quickly. So there's very strong uh, land pressure on the seaside activities. Everything outside of that little bla black frame that you can see, which corresponds to the tourist map, was what was built in the communist period. And today, that territory, those territories don't appear in the master plans. There is no territorial strategy for those estates which are completely abandoned. So what I'm interested in now is this little blue square, which is situated just after the uh, cemetery of Varna and on the edge of the old suburbs. It's a place called Chochevo, which is a little village that existed before the arrival of the communists. So what we have is a micro rayon on the edge of the old suburbs. It's a former village which was built around a little brick manufactory. And the village itself is made of bricks recovered by the inhabitants from the factory in the 1930s. And the rest of the inhabitants who didn't work in the factory worked in the fields and raised, raised livestock. And some of it still remains today. The little section I'm going to talk about today was initially planned in 68, which corresponds to the building that you can see in the northern part. And there was an addition in the 1980s, which which is the block furthest to the south, which was developed in the 1980s. This micro rayon was developed by a set of state companies, which had the possibility in the communist period to plan and build housing for their own workers. So this is uh, construction by state companies. The state companies asked the permission to build from the municipality on the plot, since the whole area is collective. The company asks the municipality for the land. It proposes a project, and then they can build. So after the interviews we've had with the, the workers who still live there, it would seem that the uh, workers built the first buildings, moved in, and then built the rest. It should be known that you should realize 
The only thing built was the buildings. The, the public spaces were built afterwards. The authorities let people move into the apartments, and then it was up to them to do it themselves. And it was, um, in general, these apartments had to be finished themselves. I think the term, the precise term, was apartments left free and finishing done by the inhabitants. And f finishing was not just painting; it's all the electrical cables all the, serv the ne network services, in fact. All that was done by residents. Today, there's a real fragmentation of public space since 91. The retrocession of land means that there's uh, uncontrolled building on this territory, uh, which with the result that this micro rayon, now new buildings have been built up, a casino, a prison cell, uh, a rehabilitation center for prisoners, and then some little um, little complexes here, uh, up here on the left. Uh, they built a restaurant, but it's been completely abandoned. And in orange, you have the location of the old factories, which have been replaced a little before 2009 by big commercial spaces. So this space is increasingly fragmented and uh, is affecting more and more the living spaces of the inhabitants. These public spaces are no longer empty, despite what it might look like on the map, because they are now appropriated by the inhabitants. In Bulgaria, you should know that 90% of people own their own apartments. The stairways uh, there's shared responsibility. It is the people who live there, who people on the same landing share share the responsibility for the for the stairway, and the public space belongs to the municipality. The problem is the municipality doesn't have the resources or the desire to work on the public space. The inhabitants have taken advantage of this laissez-faire by the municipality to intervene themselves on the public space and renovate in the absence of controls. The inhabitants do what they want, they take over the space and occupy the spaces in between the blocks. This means that we end up with the design of all sorts of forms of appropriation, um, uncontrolled parking spaces, since no parking spaces were planned, the, the authorities hadn't uh, anticipated such a fast development. There are also um, posters with uh, the regulations, sta staircase landings appropriated by inhabitants, ground floors that have become shops, but also gardens in front of the buildings. Uh, both flowers and vegetables growing there to quite a considerable extent. This is particularly amongst people aged over the 50. So this public space that seems very empty and dry is now well used by the inhabitants. They cultivate flowers, not just not vegetables. Vegetables are cultivated elsewhere. This is flowers, and also a whole series of facade appropriations, modification of balconies, extensions, or closing off the facades. As we've seen in many micro rayons and uh, many KTT, the inhabitants take advantage of their ownership of the buildings and the lack of regulations in order to change the balconies to improve the insulation, whether for apartments or several apartments, close off the balconies, extend kitchens, even extend the bedrooms. They take, a, take, take advantage of the framework of the communist buildings to extend. In the public space, we also see types, other types of appropriation, uh, which, go, which are more than gardens. We also see inhabitants, workers, working people uh, who built these these uh, constructions who have created cabins, cottages. Uh, it's, it's ignored by the, um, in, by the municipality, which means that inhabitants can build their own cottages where they can meet during uh, the summer and the winter. Today, this district, which was, which was built during the communist period is entirely appropriated. It's difficult to see what formerly belonged, uh, what it was like originally. So many people have added insulation on the front or inside the apartments. So what we have today is a kind of vertical village which spreads across the whole micro rail, whether directly on the facades or in the spaces between the blocks.
Ça donne ceci sur les façades. Uh, so this is what it looks like. The photo at the top is the southern façade and then the northern façade below. We can see a whole series of appropriations carried out by people, whether the closing off of spaces or renovation of balconies. Inside, same thing. The appropriation by the residents sometimes spreads onto the balcony. So here, for example, not here, oh, in this one, we can see the kitchen here has been extended onto the balcony with a new system of windows with ventilation systems. Uh, the cooker and the fridge are both there, you can just see on the left, have been placed directly on the uh, balcony which extends the kitchen, which is generally only four square meters. So they take advantage of the fact that the balconies, balconies are available in order to do this. This led us to say that finally, under the rotten concrete, there is life, nonetheless. So we can see that there is a consensus between the private and the public, between the inhabitants and between the inhabitants themselves in the management of the public and common spaces and the private spaces. And there is a sort of social aesthetic that has appeared through the uh, spontaneous modification of the space. So. It's the residents themselves who maintain the space and people, uh, people develop their own spaces but they're also abandoned by the state. So that brings us now to 2015 with students from the uh, architecture school from Toulouse and also the company which deals with the collective heating systems. And they've established an agreement to develop a program financed by the European Union to develop these micro-rayons. So there's been a consultation with the participants. There's a public-private between Viola, uh, Viola in France and the municipality of the city. The idea is to create the first um, uh, condominium organizations and to set up a, an agreed process of renovation where the inhabitants will have nothing to pay and it's the European Union that will supply the money. The program was ready for signature. We had developed everything for over a year and then ultimately the municipality, which was very reluctant to start with about the idea of launching a program like this, decided to withdraw from the project. So the whole project was ready, everything was ready for signature. In the last moment, the municipality said to us, you understand, it's, it's complicated because uh, we don't know whether, the, uh, whether we're going to paint it pink or yellow or red or green uh, because it's going to be complicated. There is a commercial center opposite, the shopping center. It's not an issue of, of colors, it's more to do with insulation, of heating, extension of the facades. So in any case, we won't have the money for that, so clear off. So one year of work in the bin, but it developed, led to the development of a debate in, uh, in the city and in Plovdiv on the renovation of these big um, estates. So the question is, how can we integrate the future of the micro and more generally the modern legacy into uh, urban policies? Thank you very much for listening.